Okay, we're live. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to the April 20th council meeting, which is live streamed and available on the internet by visiting the Town of Perry Sound's website at www.perrysound.ca. So, um, are there any additions or prioritization of the agenda? Seeing none, uh, may I have a mover and seconder for the agenda. Uh, moved by Councillor McCann, second by Councillor Keith, uh, that the council agenda for April 20th, 2021 be approved as circulated. Um, anyone opposed to that? Nope, that's carried then. Any disclosure of pecuniary interest or the general nature thereof? Councillor Horn. I do, thank you very much. Item 951, declaration of May 2021 as Community Living Month in Perry Sound. As Community Living, Perry Sound is my employer. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Uh, any other declarations? No? Okay. Um, minutes. Uh, may I have a mover and seconder for the minutes of a special council meeting held April 6th? Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Horn, Councillor Burden, that the minutes of the special council meeting held April 6, 2021 be approved as circulated. Mayor McGarvey? Yes. Um, could I suggest a friendly amendment uh, to the minutes? I noticed that I had made an error in um, one of the speakers at the public meeting. I corrected the name uh, to France Belisle, not France Beaulieu. Okay. All right. Is that a friendly amendment? Everybody's shaking their head that that's a friendly amendment. Okay. Um, all right, anyone, any, any discussion on the special council meeting minutes other than that? No? Okay, uh, anyone opposed to the passing of those minutes? Okay, that's carried. And may I have a mover and seconder for the minutes of the regular council meeting held April 6th? Uh, Councillor Borneman and Councillor uh, McCann, that the minutes from the regular council meeting held April 6, 2021 be approved as circulated. Any discussion on those minutes? Seeing none, anyone opposed to the passing of those minutes? Nope, oh, that's carried then. Next, we have questions of staff. Uh, Councillor Keith and then Councillor Borneman. Yes, thank you. Uh, my question is directed to them towards uh, Mr. Cairns. And my first question, Mr. Cairns, uh, has to do with um, the skate park. Uh, I know that we had been looking uh, over town as to security areas and, and possible video cameras in spots. And I'm wondering where the priority is or is there a plan at some point for a video camera in that area due to uh, vandalism at times? Um, sure, so through you, your worship, um, not that I'm aware of, uh, that has not been part of the discussion we've had uh, recently in terms of that specific location, um, but it's certainly something I can take note of and investigate as to the logistics of doing that, uh, if that's something that um, you know, council wants to consider in terms of, uh, there is obviously, I think uh, there's a lot of graffiti and vandalism, uh, unfortunately in that area, um, whether the installation of video cameras or the enhancement of light or, or a combination perhaps of those kinds of things may help that's certainly something we can look into and report back on. I, I think that would be a good idea. If you get a costing on that, I think that would be good. Everyone in favor of having a costing done on that? Yep, okay, everyone's in favor of that. And okay. I have a second question. 
Yeah. And that will be it, or I hope so. Okay. And that has to do with the recreation um, department. I'm wondering, um, because we know better spring and summer is coming. Um, is there a, a maintenance plan um, for this upcoming season? And if so, are we somewhat on target? And what's the target date to be completed for? Thank you. Certainly, uh, through your worship, uh, absolutely. Um, the Recreation Department um, puts together an annual maintenance plan. And uh, I might suggest that given the earliness of the spring, we would like to say that we are, uh, despite the weather today, hopefully ahead of schedule um, in terms of looking at making sure that everything is maintained. Um, so just with that in mind to the, uh, the use of the BOCC for the vaccination clinics has been a priority as well to, uh, for our recreation staff to be able to facilitate uh, those clinics and, um, and the use of that facility. So outside of that, that is the, the concentration of the staff. Um, I believe the typical date is uh, into May uh, for the opening of the parks, however, we are obviously well aware of the fact that spring has arrived, um, hopefully to stay for, for this year. And <laughs> staff will be uh, concentrating on making sure those outdoor amenities, because we do understand that there is going to be a, uh, a, maybe a greater expectation for access to those things. Um, I think maybe I'll just add to that. Uh, we have the two boat launches that are open, one at Champagne Street. Um, and one at Wabno Beach. Uh, unfortunately, the ramp at the salt dock sustained some damage this winter with the ice activity. So it's going to take us a little longer to try and um, determine exactly what work we need to do and how we can do it because unfortunately it's in the water uh, where the damage is. So we are assessing that in an attempt to, to get that one open as soon as possible as well. Councilor Keith. Yes, just to follow up uh, to that, Mr. Cairns, I'm wondering about um, how much pivoting, shall we say, is going on because I thought that uh, uh, students this year, we may not be having uh, summer students. And also I thought right at this moment, we were possibly short of, of one staff person. So uh, how, how is that working out? Certainly through your worship. So uh, the good news is that that um, position will be filled very shortly. Um, we have a successful candidate for that vacancy. Uh, and going through the, the budget process, the student positions um, are still in our budget projections. Uh, we were a little bit apprehensive, obviously, uh, just as of Friday, uh, we're all aware that we uh, saw new lockdown measures and that sort of thing. So um, we're apprehensive mm -hmm. to, to begin some of those hiring processes and fill those positions because we um, want to better understand what kind of position we will be in heading into the summer. But uh, having said that, like I said, staff are uh, well aware of the fact that the outdoor amenities are going to, to be, uh, you know, they're always a very popular um, amenity for folks to use and perhaps even more so this summer. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize too that we have to have staff on duty while the vaccine um, rollout is in place as well. So uh, Mr. Harris, uh, before I go to you, Councilor Borneman, Mr. Harris has a comment. Just uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, just to uh, uh, further address uh, Councilor Keith's question regarding um, we might not be able to hire all the summer part-time students and, and casual staff. Uh, we're able to do that in, in public works and rec, but we did, uh, we're looking at reduced hiring for the Stocky Center simply because of the, uh, the lockdown and the reduced hours that we're going to be able to be open. So there are, there is reduction in uh, summer staff there. Okay. Councillor Bornman. Mr. Mayor, actually, my question is for you. Um, oh. Some time ago, we uh, requested additional information from the North Bay uh, Nipissing Public Health Unit, and you've been appointed to the, uh, the board there. And I'm just hoping that you can tell us that the conduit of information, the extra 
the extra media events that uh, that staff there are doing has been helpful or not in in uh, you know keeping municipalities and people better informed and more in the loop than what had been proceeding prior. I, I think I think it's there, there's more information flowing, which is really good, and there's been good attendance at the. Uh, uh the, the the district with regard to uh, the health unit uh, catchment area with regard to uh, municipalities listening to what's going on and being able to ask some questions uh that part has been re really good are, are we getting absolutely everything that we want like to know how many people on the west side you know compared to the east side or in nipissing you know those numbers uh they still won't break that down They'll, they'll have Perry Sound District, or they will have um, uh, they'll have uh, Nipissing, and so so we're still caught in as far as that information going with just those two two things. Um, what I have been doing is I've been making sure that uh, our West Perry Sound partners are aware of any updates that. Uh, happen to to come up so I, I I can copy council on it as well if you want but I've been uh, sharing it with uh, the heads of council for each of the municipalities that uh, when I get an update um, I, I forward that off to them so they've been getting a fair bit of information at times um, and I did ask them um, a week or so ago if if you know, it was too much or, or not enough. And they said it was just right. So um, obviously, you know, I'm trying to keep that flow of information going so that people are aware of, of the updates that are, are coming along. So I can, I can copy council on that as well. Yes. I, I just want to say, and I'm only speaking for myself. Thank you for doing that. Um, you know, it, probably wasn't maybe the best uh, public perception move. Um, you know, I think uh, we, we've not always agreed with all of the steps that the health unit has taken, but I think we have to respect the, uh, their intent to, and how tough mm -hmm. the decisions are that they're required to make. And, uh, you know, with the target continuing to move and vaccines available and not available, uh, I just want to say we, that I, I truly appreciate the efforts that they're making to, you know, to get the vaccines out and to yep. keep the community as safe as, as we have been. And I want to give another shout out to the community for sticking with this. I know it's trying, it's uh, aggravating, it's, uh, it's a lot of things, uh, but hopefully if we can stay this with this for a short while longer and get more vaccine into arms, it will make a difference. So Follow the public health regulations, stay at home, wash your hands, wear a mask, yep. um, maintain your social distancing, and hopefully uh, there we'll are better days this. ahead here yeah. very shortly. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm going to have a little bit in my report with regard to it, but I have, um, um, you know, I have talked to the chair of the board. Um, we had a good discussion one night. And then I had an orientation session last week um, for uh, to bring me up to speed, basically, on you know how the board operates and how the public health unit operates and what they deal with. And it was it was a really good good session. Uh, you know, there are a number of municipal reps on the board, which which is good. They they know perfectly well that I will speak up and I will tell them exactly how everyone here is feeling. Uh, with regard to whatever issue comes along. Um, you know, there were a number of things that I, that I learned, but they also learned as well as to, to the vaccine rollout. And so one of, the, one of the issues was, was that people were wondering why there was all of a sudden, uh, you know, there would be like Perry Sounds, uh, at the BOCC, those particular, that vaccine clinic, why it was full. Well, it was full because it was booked up, 
and it was previously booked up and it was staged. But the others, they would know like all of a sudden, like only five days before they would get some maybe extra vaccines. And um, so it was really hard to plan a vaccine rollout because they can only keep the vaccines for so long and they for storage wise and that sort of thing. So it was it was a case of all of a sudden having to get it out. The other part of it was was all of a sudden we found that there were people going to um, Bracebridge, North Bay, um, Huntsville to get a shot. And they were a number of those people were booking through not all of them, but most of them were booking through the provincial system. And depending on how the postal code related, it ended up sending, if you were, let's say in, uh, because I talked to people that live in Orville and, and, and Rosso area, and they were being sent to Bracebridge. And some people that were towards McKellar and Dunchurch and that sort of thing were being sent to North Bay. So the provincial system was sending people other places and everybody was certainly very concerned because, you know, the stay at home order. Well, why are we going over there? It's because the provincial system didn't recognize where they actually lived and they thought their postal code was closer to those areas. And because Muskoka is in phase two of the vaccine rollout, they're getting more vaccines than what we are. So there was, anyway, it there, there has been this whole learning curve that not only am I learning, but they're learning as well on how this whole rollout is, is, is taking place. So, and then uh, with regard to the pharmacies, you know, I had been told that both Pollard's in the beginning, Pollard's and shoppers were doing it. And then Pollard's hadn't been informed, but Pollard's is doing it now. They are on the provincial registry. So you can go on to the provincial registry, I believe, and now, and you can book try to book for, I believe it's AstraZeneca at both Shoppers and Pollard's. So, and my understanding is, is that both, both pharmacies have been overindulged with people wanting the vaccine. So that's good news. Um, we just have to, uh, the, I'm hoping that the, the uh, resolutions that all the municipalities have passed to put in front of the government will help speed up the number of vaccines that we get um, because we do need them here and we have a very vulnerable seniors population that's still trying to be vaccinated. So hopefully that answers some of the questions, Councillor Bornemann. <laughs> okay, any other questions? I guess your worship, Councillor Baca. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, I guess my question is for Mr. Harris. Okay. Um, we are seeing um, a lot of town infrastructure projects facing steep cost increases reported by many municipalities. And I'm just wondering with the millions of dollars of carry forward projects that we have going into the 2021 budget, um, how have we addressed these costs to ensure that um, these dollars are um, quoted accurately and will there be a need for staff to review those carry forward projects moving forward to ensure that um, we are um, that these do ensure that the increase in construction costs for these capital projects due to the supply and demand and COVID induced black logs um, are applicable and included into the budget. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Pack, but the um, the projects uh, there might be a few exceptions, but generally they're tendered or there's an RFP goes out. So there's a competitive process that we obviously try to get the uh, the lowest responsible bid uh, for the job. Um, it's going to be have to be be dealt with on a case by case basis as we receive quotes, and if we found that uh, the lowest qualified bidder is higher than the budget. We have a, we'll either make a decision to try to scope back the size and this, the work envisioned to be done, or uh, if that's not possibility or it's not recommended, then we would come to council on that item and, and uh, 
request additional funding. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Any further questions? Nope. Uh, correspondence, Ms. Johnson. Mr. Worship, there are a number of items of correspondence this evening. The first items on, uh, on the listing are resolutions of support to prioritize vaccine allocation for ARIES in phase one. Uh, all these resolutions from municipalities are using primarily the same text and are similar to the town's resolution 2021-038 passed at the April 6th special council meeting. So these resolutions are coming from the municipality of McDougal, Whitestone, City of North Bay, townships of Perry, Carling, Seguin, and just today we received uh, another copy from the township of Strong. So these are all being sent to the premier, the ministers, uh, and circulated to the various participating municipalities in the uh, Nipissing, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the Perry Sound District Health Unit. Uh, the next letter is from Vic Fidelli, MPP. It's actually a response to these letters, and in particular, it was a response to the City of North Bay's request for vaccine, vaccine prioritization. Mr. Fidelli notes that reports in early April this year showed North Bay Perry Sound region achieving 23% of their successful vaccine rollout. And on the same day, Premier Ford noted that Ontario had administered over 3 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine with another 100,000 shots in arms yesterday. Therefore, 22% of all Ontario's Ontarians age 16 and over had received at least one dose. Therefore, with those stats asserted that our region is actually ahead of the provincial average at the moment. Notwithstanding all that, he asked uh, that um, or encourage municipalities to continue to advocate for pharmacies to offer vaccines in the area and for the municipalities to continue to advocate for more supply from the federal government and encourage local business to, businesses to participate in the rapid testing program. The next item is from the Township of Seguin. It's a resolution of support for Jamie McGarvey to the Board of Health that resolution has been filed. And with that support, all municipalities in the Western sector of Perry Sound District have supported Mayor Jamie McGarvey's appointment to the Board of Health representing those same municipalities. The next item is from Joanne Demick, Executive Director of Community Living Perry Sound with a request for proclamation of May as Community Living Month um, and for flying of the flag during the month of May. So under the town's uh, flag policy, administrative approval has been given to the request um, and the proclamation is covered under the agenda item 951. The next items of correspondence are a series of letters. Um, they're individual letters of the same text supporting council's position to deny construction of a vehicle bridge over the fitness trail. These um, are similar, very similar, the same text virtually to letters that were um, part of the correspondence at the last council meeting. The one um, addition to a letter that was received was in Andrea McIntyre's, which included a question as to whether council would be amenable if a group of citizens began fundraising to help purchase the lot. So I just leave that for council's information. And the rest of the letters were from Julia Cherimonte, Patricia Hume, Carrie Mutri, Pat Mastropola, Barbara Morgan, George and Alice Reed, Susan Beal, Carol Rice, Michael Walton, Susan Ferguson, Gloria Kozlowski and Stephen Smith. And the last item of correspondence is from Simone Fecto, Director of Education of the Conseil Scolaire Public de Nord-Est de l'Ontario. It is a request for su a support letter for capital funding submission to the Ministry of Education to acquire or build the French school Quatre Vents in Perry Sound. And that is covered by item 952 on the agenda. And that's the correspondence. Okay, thank you. So we have a few deputations tonight. Um, I'll remind everyone that uh, deputations are held to 10 minutes. Uh, so um, if we can have our first deputation up, which is Greg Mason, 
general manager of the Georgian Bay Biosphere. Uh, it has to do with community nominated priority places project. Oh, good evening, everybody. Oh, there you are. Welcome. <laughs> Happy Earth Week. Hope everybody finds themselves well. Just uh, pulling up some screens for myself. All right. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the, uh, the opportunity uh, to speak to you tonight um, about uh, the community nominated priority places, uh, which has been uh, named uh, in spirit with uh, or in the spirit of uh, cooperation, collaboration with the Anishinaabe communities on the coast, uh, the Mamwe and uh, which means uh, together renewal, land, and uh, life. Um, the Town of Prairie Sound, other municipalities on the coast, First Nation communities, and many organizations have been working together uh, in a variety of ways for uh, on this community nominated priority places for the last two years. It's a program that uh, is going on for another two years after this and, and hopes to have a legacy that continues on the coast in terms of stewarding species at risk. This is uh, largely federal funding that was provided to the region uh, to the tune of $2 million approximately over four years. Uh, that is going to be matched uh, to the tune of uh, $2 million over uh, four years by various community groups um, and, other, and, and other funding sources. The main goals for this initiative are to accelerate knowledge generation and collective decision-making for species at risk, and also to create more effective strategies and approaches for us to collaborate and partner together for biodiversity conservation and protection, um, and specifically to address uh, species at risk concerns. Originally, the co-applicants for this were put forward as Magnetowan First Nation, Shawanaga First Nation, the Georgian Bay Land Trust, and ourselves, the Georgian Bay Minidogami Biosphere, as the lead applicant. But indeed, uh, there are many partnerships at play uh, in this work. Uh, we have uh, well over 20, probably even more over 30 uh, different organizations and groups that are participating in various aspects of this uh, rather extensive project. As, a, as an organization or as a, as a group of organizations and collaborative, we have a steering committee that consists of the co-applicants uh, plus Wisoxing First Nation, who is uh, integral in the original design of the, of the program. And then the other intention that we have would be to hope uh, to bring multiple parties together into what we call a lands committee uh, to help us shape future directions for this work uh, in the years to come. Together with that, because we see this as, uh, as in part being consistent with the federal approach and active reconciliation on the coast, uh, we want to develop uh, very clear traditional ecological knowledge protocols and uh, information sharing uh, between and among uh, First Nation communities and uh, non-Indigenous communities, but also provide various partners opportunities for truth and reconciliation training um, and Indigenous uh, engagement training. And indeed, some of the staff from Town of Prairie Sound were able to participate in that, uh, and it was great to see that. Overall, we want to, uh, as part of this conservation initiative, engage in multi-party governance, uh, where we have shared leadership uh, on, on the coast for this important uh, topic of species at risk conservation. What we're actually doing, besides the governance side of things, is at a core, developing decision support tools. And really, this is about providing adequate information to help us prioritize both the habitats and the regions and also the areas of species aligned with where the, the threats uh, to those species are so that we can best uh, apply resources to those specific regions as opposed to a broad brush support. So for example, this picture here is of a map down in the O'Donnell Point area uh, of, of Phragmites patches uh, that have been identified in relation to uh, adjacent uh, wetland uh, habitat. This allows us to then go and target those specific Phragmites where they're adjacent or in uh, wetland habitat, not only because wetlands provide really key habitat for species at risk, but they're also possibly at the greatest threat of spread in those areas. And so again, this is a, a, a way for us to learn how to prioritize our resources and apply them most effectively. The other part of this is we're doing extensive road survey and research, and I was able to attach uh, an article about uh, some of the road work. So if you've had an opportunity to read that uh, interior good roads submission, it gives you a good sense of what it is that we're doing with respect to the road monitoring work uh, on the coast. Uh, this is an example. Uh, here is some funding that uh, the Ganawin and the Shkeke, which is the Eastern Georgian Bay Initiative Henvy Wind Offset, is going to be providing funding uh, that we can 
fly to places like Kilbert Park to expand on some of the uh, mitigation work that, are, that is going on in the park. Some of the road ecology work that you have, I'm just gonna back up, that we were able to experiment with last year was prior to the excavation of uh, the culverts in these areas, we were able to excavate the, the turtle nests that had been in that area that would very likely have been destroyed during the excavation. And we were able to incubate those eggs over the summer and release those eggs to adjacent wetlands uh, to the tune of about a thousand turtles being released mm -hmm. to that, the adjacent wetlands last summer. This not only is an effective conservation effort, we're giving a boost to turtle populations, but also proved to be very cost effective uh, for, the, for the municipality because they would have had to put up uh, permanent fencing. And in this case, we were able to avoid that cost for the municipality by having the biologists on site. When we did our cost estimates, we found that in this case, we were about 30 to $40,000 under what the, the, the fencing would have cost. The other part for us with the community nominated party place is about shifting hearts and minds, changing the value set and understanding of how people respond to species at risk and the work of conservation and seeing that it's not as much of an impediment to the, to the work uh, as some might feel. And this kind of uh, uh, sort of quote from uh, one of the construction workers on one of the job sites we were at last year is testament to uh, the value of this work for this landscape. Let's follow up on this. Some of, we're also going to be testing various mitigation strategies. This is an example of putting large riprap to try to actually discourage turtles from wanting to nest here. This year, in partnership with the Township of the Archipelago, we'll be paving uh, from riprap to riprap um, in these areas to further discourage turtles from nesting in, in their favorite sites. And then in a subsequent year, we'll be putting in artificial nesting habitats in this area. <coughs> and here's just a picture of some cute turtles being uh, getting ready for a release at the end of the last summer. We also believe uh, significantly in involving citizens and in gathering of, our, of information to support this project. So there's an iNaturalist uh, app that you can download, anybody can download, and it's a really effective for kids as well, to be able to uh, upload pictures of the species that they're finding on, on the coast and share it with the Georgian Bay Biosphere Project. Um, and it's a fantastic way of engaging in, if you, even if you don't know what the species is, uh, by using this app, experts will come online, uh, ecological geeks, if you will, will come online and verify what species that you have, uh, you have found and, and help you with the ID for that. The other one that is really, really a fascinating uh, part of this uh, project is the uh, putting up of modus telemetry arrays on the coast. And these are towers that monitor uh, bird flight uh, through and over a region. So there were uh, seven towers that were put up last year and there's a remaining tower to go up in the northern part of Georgian Bay. And this is gonna give us a much better sense of how uh, avian species, bats and birds, and as well, we can assess uh, monarch uh, butterfly uh, use of the coast and, and then get that information into decision maker uh, hands to support uh, effective, effective decision making for, for avian species. Some of the opportunities for municipalities, and, engage, and indeed we've engaged with a number of staff, uh, including your own staff on this, uh, are we're working to develop road management and ecology approaches, including best management practices for road management um, with respect to species at risk. And we're hoping to develop a tool that is very highly useful uh, and searchable, but also the, for your uh, roads managers. Um, but we're also hoping that they will provide feedback to us on how that tool can be adjusted, where it's working, where it's not working, um, and we can, we can tweak it over the years. The other component is that we're working on a planning policy and process review. So we're looking at official plans, zoning bylaws, as well as planning approaches uh, in the different municipalities and First Nation uh, communities in an attempt to look at who's doing what and share those different policies and approaches with the, with the various municipalities and First Nation land managers uh, as an opportunity for, for them to explore perhaps what different policies and approaches are working more effectively with respect to species at risk um, and to see whether or not down the road those policies will be tweaked. And as well, there will be detailed habitat mapping that will be provided for the municipalities and First Nation communities uh, to integrate as they will and wish into their own land use planning. Uh, as mentioned, there's opportunities for education and outreach and as well cultural and cross-government uh, learning uh, for uh, municipal councils and First Nation councils, as well as staff that will be available at, over, the, uh, over the course of, of this uh, grant uh, and opportunity for species at risk. 
So I fully recognize that the town of Perry Sound uh, doesn't have a whole lot of species of risk habitat within the boundaries of the town, uh, but we did want to uh, include you and where you have an interest in any opportunities for us to engage with uh, uh, your residents uh, and uh, your staff and council, we'll be happy to, uh, uh, to help. So I think that was 10 minutes. It was mostly by way of an update. There's no request for you at, the, at this time, but uh, thank you so very much. And uh, look forward to uh, seeing you in person. Well, I want to thank you very much for the presentation. That was that was good. And yeah, you're pretty much right on time. Uh, are there any questions for Mr. Mason from council members? Councilor McCann. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the report. I'm just curious about the towers and, and how they're able to measure uh, the uh, data. Um, I, I, I guess without putting you on the spot to sort of explain the technical aspects of it, uh, what exactly are the towers measuring and how do they record the information and get it to you? Yeah, for sure. So all the towers are connected uh, through cellular data plans. And uh, what they do is they pick up uh, signals, basically they send out a radio signal effectively uh, out uh, in about a 14 kilometer in, in optimal circumstances, a 14 kilometer radius um, from the towers to birds largely, uh, or others that are wearing uh, something that would basically ping off, off the tower, not physically, but digitally ping off the tower. Uh, and then that data is then uploaded uh, via cellular uh, to uh, an entity called modus.org. And, and you can go on modus.org and actually um, zoom in to the collection of towers on the coast of Georgian Bay and begin to look at the birds. So the birds have to be banded or uh, have to have these things attached. And this is where we end up with partnerships with things like Bird Studies Canada and other universities who wanna learn about those species. This is really about putting the infrastructure on the coast to allow for that monitoring to occur. Okay, that actually was my next question was, do the birds have to be banded uh, in order to send back a signal of some sort? Very interesting, thank you. Okay. Any other questions, Councilor Keith? Yes, uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, great, I'm just uh, wondering, I was really impressed with the, the presentation and the material, the, the photography, though it, it almost seems like there's a marketing for, firm or you've got great volunteers. Uh, what's the scoop here? Because it's just wonderful the way it's presented and the colors. Uh, th thank you very much. I, I will pass that compliment very quickly over to uh, our, our staff team. Uh, one of the things within Georgia Bay Biosphere that, that we pride ourselves is in is doing uh, effective communication products. Um, and, and this would be one of those, one of those examples where uh, really it's not me because I don't have that uh, uh, facility, but uh, where we have great staff who are able to uh, both take really good uh, photos, uh, but also pull it together into uh, effective communication pieces. So thank you for that. And I'll make sure to pass it on to staff. Good. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any more. So uh, thank you and uh, say hello to everybody. And yeah, we hope that uh, we can get out of this and be able to meet in person again. So absolutely. Thank Thanks you so much. much. Have a great evening. You too. Take care. Okay, our next deputation is uh, David Sweetenham, Georgian Bay Forever, and Rupert Kindersley, Georgian Bay Association. Welcome. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Would it be okay if I shared my screen? Absolutely. Great. And I'm joined by Rupert Kindersley. My name is David Sweetham, Executive Director of Georgian Bay Forever. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Rupert Kindersley, Executive Director of Georgian Bay Association. Good to see everyone. Good to see you. So am I starting this off, David? Yes, Rupert. Okay. <laughs> so what we wanted to do today is just to give you a very quick summary of our 
um, October 2020 Water Levels Symposium and some subsequent uh, research that we did. And uh, this, uh, this just sets out what we uh, achieved on that, in that symposium. Um, we had some excellent speakers. Uh, we, we got all the top scientists and decision makers that we wanted. And we addressed these uh, seven questions. So the first one was to talk about what's known and not known about water level fluctuation cycles. The next was what's known and not known about water levels control structures. Um, uh, those include not only the three that are um, managed by, by the uh, federal governments, but there are some other ones as well, which we'll go into later. Um, then we were talking about, all, do we have all the data we need to understand water levels? And if not, what data is missing? Uh, what data collection pro approaches could be prioritized? And then how can existing and, and to be collected data be converted to a consistent format? It's very difficult to uh, interpret uh, the way it is presented at the moment because it's provided in, in, in metric, <laughs> in, in meters and feet and, and uh, different, different agencies in the different federal governments. So it's a bit of a mishmash and how, how that can be presented to better informed decision making. In the afternoon, we then focused in on more on the action side of things about what improvements could be made to coordination between the control boards and their coordination with the other water level control structures. And the, and the aim here is to find ways to better address extreme high and low water levels, which we all know from recent years of how impactful these high water levels can be. And about eight years ago, how impactful the low water levels were. Um, and then tried to reach some consensus on some action that could be taken to improve coordination and ensure that we collectively use all our available methods to mitigate future extreme high and low water levels. And then we talked about next steps and we had a, a lively discussion on that. So next slide. So we were uh, hoping to really pull together the experts as Rupert said and provide some products to uh, our local community and our municipal governments and uh, really be able to put everybody onto the same page as we start to look towards the future of what we actually need to do to uh, respond to these uh, changes that we're seeing. So there are significant outputs that are published uh, following this uh, symposium. These documents have been published to both the, the Georgian Bay Association and the Georgian Bay Forever websites and are available as uh, public documents. Uh, the first was a very extensive Q&A document. Um, it is a seminal reference because it is made up of inputs from all of the official agencies, governments, and uh, research academics who are uh, viewed as the leaders in their areas, and uh, also the International Joint Commission and all of its uh, staff and uh, scientists were part of this process. Uh, it contains 259 questions, so it, it, it is quite a, a, you know, I guess an overwhelming document, 45 pages long, but as a reference for staff, as a reference for anybody that's interested in uh, knowing exactly what's going on in all of these question areas, it's certainly uh, quite a, a useful reference tool. And both the GBA and GBF will be producing a number of simplified communications products that will be public facing so that we can start to bite off uh, bits and pieces of this because we know how important water levels as an issue is to Georgian Bay and the residents uh, in the area. Uh, and we also know uh, with some alarm that there are some potential changes coming and uh, we wanted to, to make those available to our municipal government partners so that you could see what uh, potential actions might be necessary. So I'll turn it to Rupert for the key takeaways. Um, okay, so, uh... One of the things we tried to address in this symposium uh, was a, a, a large amount of misinformation that had been circulating in the public about um, what can and cannot be done about extreme water levels and who and how they you know how they arise, who controls them, etc., or what controls them. So um, one of the things that uh, we set out to prove and achieved is that the current management of the Great Lakes system is not deficient, as is often. Uh, said and include that uh, this includes plan 2012 which controls the flow from Lake Superior into Lake Michigan Huron where we are. Um, so the solution to extreme water levels does not lie with improved management of the current system. There, there is nothing materially, 
materially wrong with the way it is being managed um, uh, by the various experts on both sides of, uh, on, of the border at the moment and the, the scientists that are involved. Um, and then the IJC role. The IJ, it should be clarified that the International Joint Commission has no power in a, of itself to implement any action. All it can do is provide advice to the respective federal governments and they have to make that decision. We looked at a few other things. Uh, uh, one, this one, the first one was after the, sy synops uh, the symposium. Um, we spoke to um, Ontario Power Generation, uh, MECP, MNRF, uh, about the two water management plans in the Long Lac Ogoki uh, Basin, which is a very large basin on the north off the north coast of Lake Superior, and it's where the water flow was changed back in the 1940s to flow into Lake Superior, um, or part of the water that was flowing towards uh, uh, James Bay now flows into Lake Superior. So the question has been, you know, if we could reverse some of that flow, we could reduce the water levels. Well, the answer is you can't. In 2002, two water management plans, which are highly successful, were put in place, and they involve six First Nation uh, 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 communities in the uh, area, as well as the people I just mentioned. They're quite complex. To make any changes to that would be an extensive negotiation. Any adjustment to the flow would be minimal, uh, we feel, and it's simply not a worthwhile exercise. So. That is now off the table in, in our opinion, or I mean, it's not really off the table because you can change those water management plans, but really uh, as an, it's not going to be very significant in, in doing anything about our water levels going forward, we feel at this point. Um, the other one is to do some adjustments at the Chicago diversion, which we're still looking into. Um, but other than that, uh, you've got the uh, three control boards and the Niagara one doesn't really do anything. And, the, the, the stark reality is that the tools available right now for mitigating extreme high and low water levels are very limited. And what is needed is uh, more significant tools, uh, go big or go home if you like, and a need to make these major investments. And we'll talk more about that later. One really significant question that came up over and over again through a number of uh, participant groups, including uh, governments, uh, was why are the historic ranges of water fluctuations on Lake Michigan here on so much higher than the range that occurs up on Lake Superior? And so just very simply with these kind of schematic graphics, uh, the box represents the watershed area and the oval inside of it represents the relative proportion of the lake surface in that area. And you'll notice here that Lake Superior is about 39.1% of the overall surface area of its watershed. So a fairly significant proportion. Whereas Michigan Huron on the other hand is only about 31.8% of the relative surface area of its watershed. Or in other words, there's a lot more water that lands on the soil uh, in the watershed and then eventually makes its way into the lake body as opposed to just simply falling on the lake body itself. Um, the second issue here is that the watershed of Michigan Huron is almost double the size of the actual watershed of Lake Superior. And so with this fluxiness, you just end up with more variability and a lot more volume of water coming into the lake itself. And then third, of course, is the fact that any of the variability that occurs on Lake Superior is also transported downstream through the St. Mary's River and into Lake Michigan Huron. So we get an accumulative amount of fluctuation that happens both in the Lake Superior Basin and also then into the Lake Michigan Huron Basin. And this results in a, a larger uh, amount of fluctuation in uh, Lake Superior or in Lake Michigan Huron than in Lake Superior. The range of fluctuation of Lake Superior is about 1.19 meters. The range historically of fluctuations in Lake Michigan Huron is about 1.93 or about 162% of Lake Superior. And you can see that represented graphically here. The fluctuation historically of Lake Michigan Huron is over six feet, where it's only about four feet uh, in Lake Superior. We also heard many people say, why is Michigan Huron have the highest rate of fluctuation of all of the lakes? And of course, that's not true either. Uh, this continues to accumulate downstream. Lake Erie and Lake uh, Ontario both have wider uh, fluctuation levels than Lake uh, Michigan here on Dubs. Rupert? Okay, so 
one of the key slides that was produced at the symposium was this one from Plan 2012. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the fact that the flows uh, through uh, under the Lake Superior Control Board have been unfairly dumping water into Lake Michigan Huron. This is simply completely untrue, and this graph shows it. So if you look at this graph, the, uh, the green line is uh, the plan target, and you can see that the uh, number of months and the, the extent to which um, the flow rate has gone above that target, i.e. putting more water into Michigan Huron and, and, and taking it out of Superior is vastly less than the amount of water that is uh, the, the, you know, the decrease in flow, which has effectively decreased water levels on Michigan Huron at the expense of Lake Superior. So, uh, and this trend has continued since uh, in, into 2021, by the way. We've got some recent um, updates, haven't we, David, on that? So. Yes. Um, this slide just shows where all the control structures are. So uh, we've talked about Long Lac and Ogoki. Uh, we've talked about St. Mary's River. That's uh, from Superior to Michigan Huron. The Chicago Diversion comes out of Michigan. St. Clair River runs out of Michigan Huron into Erie. And we've all heard a lot about that over the years. The Welland Canal um, is in fact a, a point of, you know, of where there could be adjustments and that uh, bypasses Niagara Falls. Niagara River itself, and then at the bottom end of the system, the Moses Saunders uh, Power Dam at the end of uh, uh, Lake Ontario, where it flows into the St. Lawrence River. The next slide. So one thing that we heard was that uh, residents, businesses, ports, marinas, municipalities, really all of these uh, constituent stakeholders in our bay, they need to have the best available information in order to make important investment decisions, infrastructure decisions and property uh, protection decisions. And we are aware that there is a study now, an updated model that's being uh, produced by Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, Rupert and I have seen in previous public uh, presentations, um, preliminary data from this study and it was quite alarming to us and part of the driver for why we wanted to talk about this particular study. Um, in those conversations, often there are misinformations or misguided statements that somehow there, the two different methodologies of, of looking at the net basin supply, one called the components method and one called the residuals method are somehow at cross purposes in fact, they are not at all in conflict. They're used for two different purposes. And basically the measurements that uh, they produce are accurate for the purposes for which they are produced. But this new model from Environment Canada is going to use what's called the Large Lake Statistical Water Balance Model, which will reconcile any discrepancies between these two uh, methodologies. And part of what uh, this means is that action on specific improvements to the quality and content of water levels data and modeling will be coming through this process of uh, the release of this report and then the decisions that are made based on that science. Uh, and finally, one of the things that we thought was quite useful and, and we had a discussion with the International Joint Commission and the Great Lakes Adaptive Management Committee about this. They had originally back in 2012 proposed the formation of a Great Lakes Water Levels Advisory. And we felt uh, based on all of the expert opinions that were at this symposium, that uh, pursuing that water levels advisory establishment would actually be a great idea and could help facilitate all of the uh, information and sharing uh, that Rupert talked about on the data front. Um, also, we are aware and we have actually participated in the preparation or the uh, data accumulation of a project looking at the impact of water levels on our coastal wetlands. And one of the things that we kept hearing out in the public was that our wetlands were dying because the water levels were fluctuating more than five and a half feet. In fact, we know historically that's not true because water levels historically have fluctuated over 6.3 feet. And our wetlands are one of the healthiest uh, wetlands in all of the, the world right now in Georgian Bay. Our wetlands are not being pushed up against granite shorelines, they actually evolved there. And while wetland protection is definitely important, we know that wetlands are very resilient in the Great Lakes. And so maintaining uh, an eye out for this upcoming study called the Environment and Climate Change Canada Coastal Wetlands Resiliency Study, which should be coming out later this year, will be very important for anybody that wants to know the, the real science and real facts around what wetlands and what the vulnerability of those wetlands are to uh, climate change. 
So that study will be coming out. And finally, over to you, Rupert. Finally, we just wanted to um, draw to your attention a few things which we think you may want to consider, um, uh, which directly affect municip coastal municipalities on Georgian Bay. Um, so that report that we just discussed, the uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada, which is a synthesis of um, studies and research from a large number of very eminent scientists, peer reviewed studies. It's, it's a very comprehensive uh, data source that has gone into this study. We've actually got an update recently that we're hoping it will actually finally get released <laughs> within the next month, maybe, touch wood. Um, uh, and it is important. It's important to get that information out there it, uh, to inform investment decisions uh, and, and provide a context for what we can expect going forward. So the preliminary results that were released um, a couple of years ago almost um, do show um, that uh, between now and the end of the century, there will be a, a gradual increase in the, uh, the extreme high water levels. And, and I should say that all these types of studies and projections uh, have a high degree of uncertainty. So this is not a certain thing, but this is the, their best estimate of the impact of climate change on water levels going forward. Um, on the lower end of it, um, probably only around four inches below the last low. Um, and this is a gradual increase uh, over the years at a shorter duration between extreme highs and extreme lows. This, this type of um, extreme fluctuations in, in water levels and then going continuing to push, push beyond the last uh, high water level or the last low is going to, be, uh, is going to have quite an impact on, on municipal infrastructure and uh, Parry Sand, uh, you know, you have a lot along the coast there. Um, so uh, it, when you add to that wave action, increasing wave action due to climate change that we've, uh, David in particular has been measuring the increase over the last 20 or 30 years, uh, more run up, pluvial and fluvial flooding. Um, you know, th this all adds up to a lot of, a lot of activity along the coast, coast, your coast, and how on earth do you try and deal with that going forward? And, and what investments should you make? What investments shouldn't be made? So these are things I think you need to think about. Um, and you know, for planning purposes, the uh, high water marker in your, um, this may not be so relevant to you as it is to some of our other coastal municipalities, but I suspect it could be, um, is something that needs to be looked at. Uh, and, you know, it, it's not just uh, docks, it's boat launches, it's roads. Um, uh, th these types of fluctuations and, and increasing fluctuations, um, as we said earlier, they are alarming, um, which is why this report needs to be released. Um, from, from our perspective out in Georgian Bay, our primary consideration is environmental protection at residences. And, uh, and setbacks will only be effective if the high water level is correct, the high water level mark. Um, we, we're also very concerned about septic systems that uh, could get flooded um, in addition to the docks and boathouses and low elevation shoreline structures. So I'm sure you can probably think of other uh, things that uh, might be impacted in, uh, in uh, Paris Sound by this type of fluctuation. But your, your uh, town docks is, is obviously one of the primary ones. So I think that's it, isn't it? Yeah, that brings to a conclusion our comments. So, oh. Mayor Carver, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I do have one question to start off with, and that was last time during the, when the water was really, really super low, um, there was considerable discussion around the St. Clair River and the impact that the St. Clair River had on uh, water levels uh, in Lake Huron and Georgian Bay. Um, did you, part of your studies and talking to your experts and that sort of thing, and I know we met with actually um, <clears throat> one of the members of the IJC during that time. Um, what did you find, what was the impact with regard to the St. Clair River on water levels uh, in Lake Huron, Georgian Bay? David, you do that. <laughs> Yeah, at the time, one of the things that was uh, being talked about was the, the fear of extra erosion that had occurred in the St. Clair River. 
And of course, uh, that was studied quite extensively by the United States uh, Army Corps of Engineers and also Environment and Climate Change Canada. Um, if that had been true, it would have been great because it would have been a bigger channel to allow more water to rush out <laughs> of uh, Lake Huron and we probably wouldn't be sitting here with uh, the mm -hmm. high water level. It, it did have an impact, but it was considered to be minor compared to the impacts of cl this climate variability and increasing precipitation that's coming into the basin. There's been a 35% increase in what are considered uh, worst case storms. And I know for sure, because I've seen some of the preliminary uh, data that the pluvial and fluvial uh, floodplain mapping is being done uh, you know, in Ontario and in concert with uh, the, the minister's mandate letter from Environment and Climate Change Canada. I've seen some images of Perry Sound itself and what, uh, what those changes may be coming and looking like. Um, so there, there is a component of uh, what flows through the river in the St. Clair, but it's not enough uh, to help us with mitigating high water levels now. Okay. All right. No, I just wondered because it was there was a lot of talk about that at the time. And from what you were saying tonight, there's 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 other reasons for, for what's going on. So I, I appreciate that. Um, any other questions from any member of council? No? Okay. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for the presentation tonight. And I know we're, we're working with uh, you folks on a couple of other areas as well uh, to try and uh, clean things up and help the environment. So uh, uh, thank you for the partnerships. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. And thank well, Jamie, you. thanks for inviting us. Thank you. Oh, take care. Okay. You too. Bye now. Bye. So our final deputation tonight is uh, Leanne Turner, and it's the request for the town's uh, for the town to have a permanent endorsement to fly the uh, pride flag annually during June. Uh, welcome, Leanne. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, Mayor McGarvey. Uh, much appreciated. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple of documents that I'll be referring to. I understand that you would have received uh, prior to today, a letter from Muskoka Pride, the Mary Street Center, the Muskoka Perry Sound Sexual Assault Services and the National Director for Canada Pride. Um, I just wonder if somebody can confirm that everybody did receive that in advance. I know there were a number of things that we did receive that I read over the weekend, Ms. Johnson, was everything that Ms. Turner uh, mentioned, were they all received? I'm, uh, I do not believe I have all of those items. Um, with respect to a letter from the Mary Street Center, there was an email sent without an attachment. I responded oh. requesting the attachment, but didn't receive it. Um, there is a letter from Muskoka Pride that was attached to the material circulated with council. Uh, and there was an email from um, um, Muskoka Perry Sound Sexual Assault Services that yes, indeed was attached to the uh, agenda. And, but I don't believe that I received anything from uh, Director of Pride Canada. Okay, I'll uh, I'll be able to refer to those then. Thank you. Okay, well, thank um, you. that help. That's helpful to know. So um, last year, um, I approached the town of Perry Sound to support the flying of the Pride flag in June of 2020. Uh, that was approved, and I'm appreciative of that. I paid for uh, the flag and loaned it to the town. Uh, today's delegation is to request that the town of Perry Sound Council acknowledge and declare in the town of Perry Sound that June is Pride Month and to celebrate this by the purchase of and public display of the pride flag, which is the rainbow flag at the town of Perry Sound uh, flagpole each and every June for the month of June uh, from 2021. Uh, forward. And my rationale for that uh, relates to uh, 
good community initiatives. Um, I'd like to take you back to 1981. Um, that was the beginning of uh, the movement of Pride and it was as a result of violence uh, by police against targeted groups. Uh, moving forward to 2016, Pride uh, and Black Lives Matter uh, got together to discuss how they can support inclusion uh, within uh, our, our communities. So in, um, in 2020, Council approved the flying of the Pride flag upon request, request and one question concerning the length of time was raised at uh, a town meeting. Um, the uh, issue, I guess, was addressed in that it was decided that uh, the flag would fly for one month. And there were uh, a couple of very positive comments to support it, and there were no concerns. Uh, thank you to Council for supporting this request, and it was moved by Ms. Keith and Mr. Burton. Uh, the discussion uh, confirmed June as Pride Month, and that was by Mr. Bourne. Um, and I'd like to present to you that federally, provincially, and uh, in many, many municipalities in uh, Ontario, uh, June is considered Pride Month. And I would like us as a good community and an inclusive community to consider doing the same as other municipalities. So uh, Ms. Keith at the meeting in 2020 indicated that together we are stronger. And unfortunately, um, you know, we've had uh, news today of uh, a tragic event and trial that's gone forward. And, um, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter and the Pride have always supported that this is an example of showing that our community is strong and that we are together and inclusive. So recognizing council's positive response in 2020, uh, I make the request to you as a good gesture and recognition so that uh, while Perry Sound does not have a pride committee and I as an individual, uh, would be happy to make this deputation every month uh, or every year, pardon me. Um, I think that we're at the stage and time in our um, municipality where we can, as a corporate or cultural uh, entity, recognize that pride does provide for um, inclusion. Various municipalities recommend recognize pride as a mark of their corporate culture. And they have pride displays, they have pride celebrations, they may have uh, rainbows on uh, roads for a short period of time in June. And this would favorably place Perry Sound as supportive of pride on a corporate cultural level. Supporting Pride Month indicates the culture of the town is supportive, is progressive, and promotes inclusion. It shows uh, a core value of compassion in action. Uh, references of interest uh, were provided on my document. Um, there are 20 ways a community can support Pride Month. There's many reasons why we would support Pride Month in the next uh, link. There's another link on 10 more ways to support Pride Month. Niagara Health has uh, Pride support uh, documentation on their website. Uh, Muskoka Pride started as a grassroots organization in 2009. And they indicated that they have had uh, invitations and did participate in uh, cafes. Um, I think it was at the Mary Street Center and they support this by way of letter. West Nipissing now supports uh, Pride. And of course, we're all aware of the, um, the Toronto uh, flag um, and Pride parade and, and support of Pride. 
One of the uh, interesting things that I learned when I was um, sort of researching this was that there is a community uh, in uh, Ontario called Emo. I believe it's up north. And they rejected uh, the concept of acknowledging pride as uh, something that would happen every year in June in that community. And there was quite a backlash and they withdrew that uh, decision and it's now um, uh, declared in June. Elliott Lake actually has the Northern Ontario Pride Network and it's in its uh, fifth year. And I'd like to just mention a couple of the letters to make sure. One moment, please. So Muskoka Pride uh, wrote the letter in support of the request before council to raise the rainbow flag in Perry Sound during the month, month of June. They provided background as to Pride and the fact that um, while in Toronto it began in 1981, it actually started as a movement in 1969 in um, New York City. Um, they say that raising the rainbow flag sends a message to members of a community that inclusion matters and marginalized voices should be raised up. It makes a statement about the values of a community and the importance of a diverse and inclusive society. In smaller communities like those found in central Ontario, many people who identify as LGBTQ+, often feel alone and isolated due to limited resources and distance to urban centers. Seeing the rainbow flag lets someone know that they are welcomed and ce celebrated in their community. Um, I won't read the other ones, but the Mary Street Center, they supported. Muskoka Pride, as you know, supported. The um, Muskoka uh, Perry Sound Sexual Assault Care Center supported. And I will find um, the letter from the Canadian Pride Group, uh, which is federal and they support it. So for those reasons, I would like uh, town council to commit to June every year as Pride Month and commit to the purchase of the flag and flying it. And I welcome your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions? From any council member? Everybody's uh, all questioned out from the others, I guess. Uh, maybe. Um, I, I, we can have something. We can have something brought to uh, Councillor Keith as a question, but we can have something brought to the next council meeting uh, with regard to that. Um, I, uh, council, council in favor of that? Kind of a show of hands. Yep. So. We'll have something brought to the, the next next council meeting. Councilor Keith, did you have a question? That was just going to be my comment. Thank you. Okay, all right, very good then. Okay, uh, I don't see any questions and we'll bring this and deal with it at the next council meeting. So, um, all right. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, that's it for deputations for tonight. Now we have reports and I'll go by the screen as to, so Councillor McCann, you're up first. Thank you very much. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, council, staff and public. Just one meeting to report on and that uh, is the uh, Perry Sound Public Library Board monthly meeting. Uh, along with Councillor Backman, I attended uh, Wednesday morning, April 14th, uh, the, uh, I was going to say monthly meeting, but we're meeting every other month now. Uh, this one, again, was uh, electronically by Zoom. Regular business conducted of financial reports uh, were received. Um, with the uh, effective Thursday, April 8th, Ontario entered into a declaration of emergency and stay-at-home order. The Perry Sound Public Library will remain open for curbside pickup only until further notice. And our curbside uh, pickup hours 
um, are Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Tuesday from 10 till 3, Wednesday from 1 till 6, and Thursday from 10 till 3. And you're invited to go to our website uh, to uh, reserve a book for hold and to make arrangements to uh, to pick it up. Some other information that uh, and uh, matters we covered at the meeting uh, were the new technology center that's been named after the C uh, the C and corporate services. Uh, we've uh, things are coming together with wiring. Uh, fundraising is underway for a kids portal escape into knowledge. It's an online thing, and uh, the library just continues to turn a lot of heads in our own uh, industry uh, across the north and the province with the, the things that we're doing online and with our staff uh, on location. That's the Perry Sound Public Library, and that is my report. Okay, thank you. Councillor Borneman. Good evening, Your Worship, uh, everyone at home. Um, <coughs> Uh, at our last uh, meeting, I had reported that the uh, province had uh, agreed to fund 24 additional bed spaces at Belvedere. Uh, there is no formal agreement. There are no engineered drawings. They've just pledged this funding. Uh, in reviewing this, the board at Belvedere has uh, come to the belief that uh, 24 bed spaces is inadequate for the needs of uh, West Perry Sound. And uh, we've formed an ad hoc committee to investigate the potential of a campus of care site in our community. The campus of care is basically a senior's village with services ranging from uh, total independence to uh, folks who require total support um, it would increase the number of beds and provide a, a higher level of uh, or better level of care and a wider array of services. Uh, it's unlikely that the current site, which is, as we all know, pretty much maxed out, would uh, accommodate uh, such a, a plan. <clears throat> Further, uh, Belvedere was built before the, the is aging and it was built before the world of uh, superbugs, making it difficult to uh, assure the safety of our seniors, uh, which is paramount and costly to maintain. Embracing this concept, which is a direction that the province has approved, provides more beds, better care, and ultimately will prove to be uh, more cost effective in, in caring for our seniors. We're currently at a very preliminary stage of, of uh, this investigation. We have no agreement with the province. We have no design, no engineered drawings. I uh, bring this forward tonight only to keep council and the community aware that it's a direction that we're investigating and hope to be able to pursue at some point uh, in the future. Um, and that's my report for this evening, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Barnum. Councillor Burden. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and welcome everybody. Um, on April the 8th, I took part in a monthly meeting of the District Social Services and Administration Board by way of Zoom. And then on April 15th, I sat in on a special meeting along with our CAO, Mr. Harris, as we met with the CAO, Chairman of the Board, and CFO of the DSAB, the Perry Sound District Social Services Administration Board. Uh, I'm going to go back a few years here and give some background regarding this issue for the benefit of the public. When the hub, which is the affordable housing project at the site of the former William Beattie School was developed, it was intended that it would be a property paying our property tax paying entity. Um, under provincial regulations, housing projects that meet the requirements that qualify as providing relief for the poor can apply for property tax exemption. After the hub development was completed, the developing agency applied to CMHC to request that they be considered for tax exemption and were granted that exemption. Uh, the cost to the town uh, for this move uh, is quite substantial each year. 
And of course, the other taxpayers, residential and commercial, need to make up that lost revenue. Since this facility, facility provides needed subsidized housing for people from the entire district, it hardly seems fair that only the taxpayers in the town of Perry Sound should bear the burden of this lost revenue. One of the requirements under the relief for the poor exemption states that public money must be used on the project uh, when it's developed. Um, in the case of the hub, money was granted by CMHC and was funneled through the DSAB. The purpose of our meeting on April 15th was to request that DSAB add a condition to their agreements in the future that insists that the developing agency agrees that they will not apply for such tax relief on future projects in the town of Prairie Sound when, when the funds uh, come through uh, DSAB. Um, unfortunately, DSAB CAO Tammy McKenzie made it clear that they were unable to, to uh, add that clause to their agreement uh, as they were advised by the, the uh, legal people for DSAB that, that it wouldn't uh, hold water. Uh, it would be easily overturned if anybody objected to it. So that, that's basically as far as we can go with that. But the only thing I, I will say that both uh, CAO and, and uh, chairman of the board of DSAB are very sympathetic. Uh, but they don't see it as being a DSAB problem. And uh, quite uh, frankly, neither do I. Uh, it's a problem at Queen's Park. It's a provincial government problem. And I think all we can do is continue to, uh, to lobby uh, any of our contacts uh, in the future and try and get this legislation changed for future. Because we certainly don't want to hamper this type of development. We want to uh, see it continue to happen. So and that's my report. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think that's possibly one of, I was talking to um, Mr. Harris today about um, delegations at the AMO conference and certainly that could possibly be one of them as well, along with a couple of others that we talked about. So um, I think uh, they're gonna, staff are gonna bring something forward to, if there's any suggestions of different delegations that we might be able to make at that particular time. So um, uh, we're, we can, I, I think that's a, a good one to, to add to the list. Um, Councillor Horn. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On April 12th, I attended the Chamber of Commerce board meeting. The new board continues to operationalize a strategic plan. An events committee, a membership committee, and a marketing committee have been struck as working groups and continued to work with area business businesses through this extremely difficult time during another pandemic lockdown. We also had an excellent presentation from the Near North Board on the benefits of co-op placements for area businesses. And again, it was a very well done presentation that promotes um, the use of co-op students to learn about the businesses in this area and hopefully provide a career path so students will stay in the area. And that's my report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Keith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, fellow councillors, uh, staff and the public. I attended the Accessibility Advisory Committee meeting. This was its first meeting and uh, our Human Resources Director, Alicia Lesperance was there and for staff as well as Ann Herdman getting things underway as well as some of the new members. Uh, we now unfortunately have two vacancies and therefore those positions will be posted. Um, this is a, the vacancies are unfortunately the result of a death and a resignation. So there will be two positions posted and hopefully we will have uh, some volunteers come forth so we can add to this committee again. Uh, the chair was elected and now that will be Bill Liggins and the vice chair, Kelsey uh, Quinnell. So congratulations to all. Uh, the procedural bylaws were reviewed and the next quarterly meeting where we'll get down to brass tacks, so to speak, will be in July time. I also attended the uh, 
Community Policing Advisory Committee meeting. And we reviewed the stats between January and March of this year compared to last year. Basically uh, matters, and I believe COVID-19 has a lot to do with this, but in different areas, the uh, stats are down. Um, the foot patrols are down. Uh, the um, <clears throat> stats for drugs and assaults are also down. Um, and that is positive in, in the, that area. Um, however, one has to also ask themselves, uh, is it also due to COVID-19 and what other things may be coming into play? Um, also the uh, police officer that looks after community services, um, he was involved, uh, Joe Scali was involved in, Joe, in uh, virtual meetings and uh, uh, also the situational table or now called the impact was uh, quite involved. Um, in this past uh, quarter, as that is a committee that assists for, with, uh, with um, people who are high risk needs and uh, those uh, stakeholders that can get involved in the community try to come up with a solution to try to help individuals in our community as we are all part of a, a group here. So that's pretty important. And uh, finally, I would say that um, high, there, in the past uh, quarter, uh, Highway 400 was targeted and uh, the police stopped uh, a number of people and there certainly were some drug seizures of cocaine and hydromorph and fentanyl. Finally, in conclusion, I think this, and we will hear more in the future about it, is uh, the Ontario government of Ontario government is um, going to be establishing uh, police service boards throughout the province. And committee members um, discussed at our meeting how we are really pleased that our commune, our committee has been very effective and efficient and worked together. And committee members uh, were of the hope that the structure that we have been using in our community, because this is not the case throughout the province that all um, uh, communities have been working uh, in a uh, cohesive uh, structure like this. But in our area, we are hoping that each municipality, uh, First Nation and uh, a, an organized uh, township, all of us can look at how we can come up with uh, resolutions that support at least the concept and the format of what we have been able to create in this community because uh, the advisory committee, which has been very long-term in this area, um, as I said, the composition has worked very well, and we seem to have been able to be very proactive in uh, a number of ways. An example would be um, in reference to this situational table, or now called impact, that I just spoke about, because we know the Ontario government is looking at wellness in the community and how can we do a better job, and I would say that this uh, advisory committee and with the involvement of the OPP has been ahead of the uh, curve there because that uh, was created in 2017, as well as we've tried to involve those First Nations who at this point uh, were receptive to being in, a, in this committee uh, uh, as to attending the meetings and providing input. So we're hoping that uh, uh, resolutions will eventually come forth so that we can show that as a group together, we can see uh, a format that we think may be able to be worked or tweaked uh, that can be beneficial to our community. And I'm sure we'll hear more in the future. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Backman. Thank you, Your Worship. Good evening, everyone. On April 14th, I attended the public uh, Perry Sound Public Library uh, board meeting, which uh, Councillor McCann has noted to. And I also on the same day had attended an executive meeting um, for park to park trails and the new board continues to work towards our short term and long term goals 
which is um, really getting our um, trail in a, a suitable position that can be used for multi-use. Um, and then uh, before the uh, recent stay at home orders, I met with a gentleman named uh, John Aldworth, who um, has recently taken an interest into the Perry Sound Skate Park and in finding ways to um, improve, uh, make improvements to um, that uh, infrastructure and the area to support uh, our youth in the community. And that's my report for this evening. Okay, thank you. Uh, council staff and public, April 8th at 6.30 in the evening was the Perry Sound District Social Services Board meeting. And then April 8th at 7.30 p.m. was the Pool Wellness Committee meeting. And we heard from the consultants about their review of the costing. Given that there are some out there that are throwing around some pretty wild numbers, the consultants are confident in the numbers that they provided to the area. And there were also updates from the municipalities. April 15th at uh, 1 p.m. I attended the bi-weekly meeting for the North Bay Perry Sound District Health Unit with the district municipalities. Uh, good information session and everyone got to hear and ask questions uh, with regard to uh, COVID-19 and what's happening in our district. April 16th uh, in the morning, I had an orientation uh, session uh, an introduction to the North Bay District uh, Health Unit with the chair of the board and uh, the secretary for the board as well. Uh, a lot to learn, which is really, really good. Um, and I certainly welcome uh, the challenge and uh, uh, being part of, of that particular board. April 20th, uh, a meeting, at, today with the Solicitor General's office to discuss OPP board structure. Um, Councillor Keith has uh, mentioned that in her report as well. It seems so far that it's not going to be business as usual from what they're presenting. They're looking also at a 20% community representation component and a 20% provincial appointees as well. As the First Nations also have the Anishinaabeg Police Force, this will also have to be worked out as well. They weren't clear as far as what we have here today, even though I asked the question as to how that is all going to fit together. Um, there were also questions around compensation and who pays for the remuneration for provincial and community members. And uh, will there be part participation from the unorganized areas as well? Uh, so this, Bottom line is, is this is going to cost us more. Uh, it seems that way anyway, and I'm sure there's going to be considerable discussion, certainly Council Keith at your CPAC committee. Um, they even threw out that there may be consideration for two boards in one detachment area, uh, given the makeup of that particular detachment. Um, and I, I don't know, from what I found, there seemed to be more questions uh, to be asked, even though they presented what they were doing. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, the, the different detachment areas, there was a lot of people on the call. Um, it was a Zoom discussion and there were, there were a couple of hundred people on it from all across Ontario. They have another one scheduled as well, um, I believe for later in the week, but this one fit with my schedule. So uh, I, Councillor Keith, you're gonna have a lot of questions and a lot of discussion, I think at uh, the CPAC committee and the CPAC committee here, here has worked really well. And um, I, I just hope it doesn't have to change too much uh, and reinvent a wheel. So that's my report. Okay. On with the agenda. There was no closed session, so um, nothing coming out of that area. So we'll go to 911, moved by Councillor Keith and seconded by Councillor Horn. 
the council approved the progress report on the town's key performance objectives. KPOs as set in Schedule A. Uh, Mr. Harris, is is there a presentation you're going to do with this tonight, or are we expecting that everyone read it? Uh, Mr. Mayor, no, there's no there's no presentation. This is a standard format that we started in the fall of last year. Yeah. It, I just would say that in addition to uh, KPOs that that relate to the strategic plan, we've started to include quarterly key quarterly statistics. So if members of council see uh, or are aware of information that they'd like tracked and reported on a quarterly basis, we're happy to add that. Yeah, that's good. I mean, we also have our council task trackers too that uh, everyone can uh, tap into as well. Uh, Councillor Borneman, you had a question. I was just going to ask Mr. Harris if there were any new things that he might want to highlight for the public, but I think he pretty much just did that. <laughs> <laughs> Good enough. <laughs> okay. Any further questions on this report? And I take it this report will be on the website so people can look at it uh, at their leisure, Mr. Harris? Yes, that's correct. The uh, The quarterly statistics will be there as well, so Good. members of the public can track progress. Good. Any, any further questions? I'm not seeing any or hearing any. Anyone opposed to the passing of uh, this resolution? Nope, then it's carried. Item is 912. If I can get it from the other one. Uh, moved by Councillor Borneman, second by Councillor Burden. Whereas the town has received a request from Sale Perry Sound for $20,000 for the remediation of the erosion on the Rotary Sunset Trail. Whereas the Rotary Sunset Trail is on the lands leased by the town from the town by Sale Perry Sound. Whereas the town of Perry Sound leases the property to Sale Perry Sound for a nominal amount, and Sale Perry Sound does not pay property taxes on the leased land. Whereas the lease agreement states that Sale Perry Sound is responsible for the maintenance and repairs of the property, whereas there is a concern that a reconstruction of the trail rather than remediation is required involving proper engineering design and construction to complete a safe, lasting trail at a cost greater than $20,000 estimate provided. Whereas the scope of work has not been clearly defined. Whereas it is unclear if other funding partners such as Sail Perry Sound, the Rotary Club, et cetera. And whereas the town has an interest in supporting some reconstruction of the trail subject to a detailed proposal being provided. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the council requests that Cell Perry Sound submit a proposal setting out the work to be done, identify funding from all sources, and indicate their intention at the end of the current lease. And further, that this council approves the reallocation of up to $20,000 of unassigned funds from the Federal Gas Tax Reserve Fund to the Rotary Sunset Trail Rehabilitation, and further, that the actual amount of funds be committed to the project will be subject to the receipt of the above information to the satisfaction of council. Discussion. Councilor McCann. Yeah, yes, thank you. As we spoke to, uh, to this uh, at our last regular meeting, I'm very pleased to see this going forward and I certainly support it. I'm very excited to, to uh, see what could come about. I think our, our waterfront is something that we need to be uh, continue to be very proud of and uh, do the best thing that we can uh, so that when people do come, uh, if they're coming for business on Sail Perry Sound or just as a, a tourist, that they get to uh, enjoy the, uh, the full benefit of the, the waterfront. I do have one question and just a, a clarification. Has Sail Perry Sound actually asked for the $20,000 or have they just asked for the, the work to be done? Uh, through through the mayor, they they sent in a request prior to the uh, start of the budget process, requesting twenty thousand. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Anything further? Not seeing or hearing anything. Anyone opposed to the passing of this resolution? Nope, then it's carried. Moved by Councillor McCann, second by Councillor Backman. Whereas the Optimus Club do donated $40,000 to the town of Perry Sound in 1994 for the use towards a recreation center, whereas the town is the lead applicant in a joint ICIP application on behalf of seven municipalities and two First Nations communities for a recreation and cultural center, whereas the timing to address questions concerned raised during the process and to confirm the support of all partners is critical. And where is there a need to engage external resources in this process? Now, therefore, be it resolved that Council authorizes staff to utilize the funds donated by the Optimus Club for the purposes of retaining external resources in support of the recreation and cultural project. Discussion. Councillor Borneman. I just wondered if the Optimus Club had been notified of this decision, just as a, giving them a heads up as to how this money would be invested. Uh, through the uh, through the chair, no. Um, I mean, this money's been sitting there since 1994, uh, but we haven't contacted the current executive. Uh, we could certainly do that and let them know. Uh, and to confirm that the monies that they originally provided to the town are going for the intended purpose. Councillor Keith. Yes, thank you. I'm just wondering in um, going forward in engaging external resources, what happens if uh, the cost is over 40,000? Who is picking up that tab? How is, how is the extra going to be divvied, shall we say, for an expense? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Keith, we wouldn't be committing or going over that amount. And I'm not even sure we need that amount. Um, just getting the authority to use that money at this point. The steering committee for that uh, reports to the Wellness Center and Pool Committee still needs to come up with, a, with, with that plan, um, but we do want to move quickly. Uh, we're in discussions with the why. We need to deal with lawyers. We've got presentations to make to McKellar and other communities. We'll need the consultants that helped us uh, to, to get us to this point. So uh, I don't anticipate spending all of the 40,000 and certainly wouldn't look to going committing more than the 40,000. Okay. Anything further? Nope. Okay. Uh, anyone opposed to the passing of this resolution? Uh, okay. I'm not seeing any opposition, so that's carried. Okay. It's moved by Councillor Horn and second by Councillor Keith that uh, Council received the auditor's 2020 financial year end audit planning report as presented by Giselle Bodkin, BDO engagement partner. And I believe, Giselle, you have a presentation or some comments you'd like to make. Welcome. Yes, I Thank you, Your Worship and Council members. Uh, great to meet you guys uh, remotely. Um, I'm not going to take a lot of time. I know everybody's tired and it's near the end of the day, but uh, we are supposed to uh, reach out to Council um, twice a year uh, before we start the audit and then also at the end of the audit if there's um, any concerns that Council wants to bring up to us and just give you a highlight I've got an executive summary. So I thought I would try to share my screen here, if I could. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I can. Yeah, usually I can share the screen. I don't know if any of the staff there can share it. Michelle, did you uh, 
do you, do you want to come on and see if you can share it? Michelle Jin is our manager that is on the call too. Oh, here it is. Share screen. I got it. I don't know why I couldn't figure that out. All right. Sorry, guys. I've been doing this a lot lately. So I'm just going to give you the executive summary of, of the audit. So the audit team is myself, um, who's going to be the engagement partner, and Michelle Jin, uh, who's also on the call, is our manager. And we also have a senior that is working on our file. I'm hoping everybody can see here materiality. Materiality for, for um, the municipality is 690000 which is very similar to last year. It's really based on your budget, and most auditors will take 2 to 3% of your budgeted expenses. Um, the timeline, we, we've started to do some interim work, and um, we look to do most of our work in May and report back to council. Um, the fees are around 31000 for all of the um, reports that we're going to do, because there's some sub-audit reports too. And the other thing we want to highlight is any audit risk. So um, management override of controls is always a risk. And so one of the things we do is review journal entries that were, were done by management. Revenue recognition is always like a fraud risk. So um, we do some extra work around that. Um, purchases cut off. So what happens sometimes with municipalities is things come in after the year end. So we're always looking to make sure um, the treasurer has all the information from all the other departments so that those payables are accrued. Um, another thing is we have to look at any contaminated sites and put disclosure on the statements um, and any assets that were contributed. So these are kind of standard um, risks that you would see in a lot of municipalities. And I just wanted to, um, so uh, through you, your worship, uh, just to open up if, if there's any uh, fraud that council is, is aware of right now or any concerns they want, want to bring up to the auditor. Uh, the reason why we ask this question is that if somebody knew something, it might change our audit approach. We might do some extra testing in an area that was a concern. So pretty quiet, so I'm assuming nothing. And, and again, you can email us. Councilor McCann, you had your hand up. Yeah, I did. I'm just kind of curious, going back to contaminated sites, what exactly are you looking for there? And why is this highlighted here with, uh, with all the other, uh, yeah. <laughs> other <laughs> facts and numbers? Just curious. Um, well, just about probably three years ago or four years ago, the Institute of Chartered Accountants said, um, we want to know um, if there's a contaminated site that is actually not in use. And um, it's funny that they don't worry about in use sites. And what, you're, what the municipality has to do is, um, you know, hire an engineer, find out, either do, I'm, I'm trying to think if it's a level one or level three study. And the engineers will say, here's what we think that it's gonna cost us to shut that down or clean it up. And if you're under the obligation to clean it up, um, meaning you've got something from the Ministry of Environment um, telling you that you have to clean it up, you're supposed to estimate the cost of that cleanup and accrue it in the financial statements. So it's like a, a liability risk yes. more than anything. Absolutely. And a substantial cost as well. Right? Yeah, and it's a substantial cost, yeah. Okay. Very right, good thank question. <laughs> thank you. Um, so bearing nothing on the fraud, we um, the, this is just kind of our timeline here that um, we expect to have the audit done in May and June uh, with your team and uh, send you the financial statements there shortly after. And um, yeah, and the, and the rest of this is just kind of the different procedures that we do on these risks that I was just talking about. And uh, yeah, I think... Uh, Michelle D. Oh, and then just back to the fees. Um, I think I have. Yeah. So we there's a there was a little bit extra fee this year because we were asked to help prepare the financial statements, which is usually done by by your treasurer. But there was a lot of extra groupings and mappings, so they need some help this year with that. But other than that, we don't expect uh, any extra fees. And um, Michelle, if you're on the call, do you have anything you want to add? 
Um, I am on the call, and I guess it's just we have to ask the standard questions for fraud. Is that um, any council members are aware of any actual suspected or alert fraud inside the organization or with any of the service organizations, which are including the investment advisors? Uh, these investors' advisors applicable to Perry Sound are um, CIBC, Wood Gandhi, BMO, or One Investment. Thank you. Yeah, and then basically what we'll do through through you, your worship, we will, um, after we finish the audit, um, we will usually meet with the management team, um, treasurer and CAO, and if there's any recommendations for controls. We are finding out of COVID, the controls have changed on most municipalities. Um, people are signing off things remotely. Um, so we've had to redesign some of our audit steps because of that. Um, because some controls we can't rely on. If, if you sign like a, you know how everybody signs off on a PDF, but a lot of times if that PDF isn't locked, then, um, you know, we have to do more substantive testing, which is actually looking at paperwork versus relying on controls. So that's the only thing that's happened in the municipal space this year that would affect your audit. I appreciate that. And that's happening across a number of committees. I know our AMO board, you know, has had to look at new ways of doing business as well, you know, um, because most people are working remotely now. So uh, the auditors have certainly, their auditors have certainly expressed the same things that you have as well. So uh, there's consistency. <laughs> Thanks. Any Thanks. other questions? Seeing none, okay. Um, with regard to the report, um, uh, the council received the auditor's 2020 financial year and audit and audit planning report as presented by uh, Giselle Bodkin, BDO engagement partner. Anyone opposed to passing that resolution? No, nope, it's carried then. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Take care. Uh, moved by Councillor Burden and second by Councillor Bornham and the Council received the 2020 annual report, closure monitoring program at Farland Street uh, landfill site for information purposes. Any discussion? Um, Councillor Bornham, then Councillor McCann, then Councillor Keith. So Mr. Karen's uh, two questions. Is there anything new or exciting that we should particularly take note of with this year's version and um, this report has been coming for many, many years. Is there any end in sight with the necessity of producing this report on a annual basis? Uh, through your worship. So um, I guess to answer the first question, uh, there isn't anything particularly uh, attention getting, which in this case is a good, good thing. Um, the landfill site has been performing as expected um, through our monitoring program uh, with no new uh, or expected further new or expected degradation uh, to the environment. And uh, to answer the second question, um, there is an opportunity for us to explore reduced uh, monitoring requirements. So the idea being that uh, we will be pursuing um, in the near future, uh, some allowances from the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, the ability to reduce the amount of monitoring and the frequency of monitoring of that landfill site based on its historic uh, um, record. Uh, environmentally. So uh, we've had some recent work up there with the uh, solar farm being placed on top of the closed landfill, part of the closed landfill. Uh, so the, the recommendation was we want to accumulate a little bit more monitoring data with that facility in place. There is no anticipated uh, negative impacts to the uh, performance of the closed landfill site due to that. 
but we do want to have that performance data in place so that we can uh, have that discussion with the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks going forward to reduce the frequency of our monitoring and uh, reporting requirements. Uh, Councillor McCann and then Councillor Keith. Okay, thank you. So I, Councillor Borneman kind of asked the first question I, I had in mind in terms of uh, uh, what, if anything specific stands out. Uh, question one, with the work being done on the solar uh, farm, uh, I, I, obviously the, the land is dug up and the disruption, I guess that's a concern then uh, for, uh, uh, for potential, uh, increased potential risk then, uh, Mr. Kearns? Uh, through your worship, um, not exactly. So the, the, the solar panels were installed um, on pedestals, essentially drilled into bedrock. So okay. for the most part, um, that installation is not, it, it's not installed on, on the capped landfill site, for instance. But uh, part of the um, discussion initially with the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks was the concern for increased runoff uh, in the area and changes in drainage patterns. Uh, which we did address with our consultant and through the planning process of that uh, project before, before it started construction. So there is no uh, anticipated impacts um, to any of that. M mainly it was um, what, what the changes to the drainage patterns might be due to the installation of the solar panels, which we did address to their satisfaction. So we've talked about a reduction in reports as the years move on. Does there come a time, and I think I read somewhere some time ago that it takes decades and decades before uh, a landfill site is, is actually fully redeemed, I guess. Is that true? Uh, if, so through your worship, these, uh, these landfill sites um, are what were referred to as natural attenuation landfill sites when they were constructed. So essentially that, um, it's kind of a fancy way to say that uh, nature will take care of itself as, as the waste is placed and it, yeah. it does take a long time. Um, so I, I think uh, perhaps it was a, a good discussion just before this with the, the auditor, auditor firm talking about uh, contaminated sites. So this is the, the kind of thing that um, closed landfill sites may be considered a liability and that's part of the reason is that uh, I'm not sure we know exactly how long it may be just yet before uh, before monitoring requirements are removed entirely and uh, I'm not certain that I, I will see the end of that. And I understand it's been something like 41 years since uh, it officially was closed. Uh, yeah, so there, there is some, uh, there was some activity, some minor activity, um, I think in the early 2000s, don't quote me on that date, but there, there was some minor activity that happened, but um, so, so the monitoring results have been fairly consistent, which is good. Uh, we haven't seen an increase in any of the contaminant levels, uh, which exist within all, all of these types of installations. So uh, it, as I said, it's performing as expected. Um, typically, th they don't degrade quickly. Great. Okay, thanks very much. Very interesting. Councilor McCann, I think some archaeologist a thousand years from now will probably dig up stuff there and say, oh, look what I found. Look what they did. <laughs> <laughs> I found some old council resolutions or something. You never somewhere. know. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Councilor Keith. Yes, thank you. Councillor Borneman already covered one of my questions, but my second question is, um, do you keep track of roughly how much time is uh, spent on this monitoring? I, I'm looking at uh, time, cost, or efficiency. I'm wondering, is there anything covered there? Uh, through your worship, so the majority of the time is consultant-based time. So we are invoiced. Um, so certainly we have those records. I can't tell you what they are. Off, uh, so we're billed accordingly to the, uh, the time and the effort essentially spent on producing the, uh, the results and the reports. So there is um, 
there's obviously professional time for the staff uh, for with our consultant that are compiling it. There's travel, there's sampling, there's sampling supplies, and then there's lab analysis costs as well. So we, we do have those, um, but I have not taken a direct look at uh, a comparison, but uh, typically in my experience in my past, it, it's very similar from year to year. Um, we start to see some CPI type increases in costs and that sort of thing, but uh, they don't typically vary um, a whole lot. And the consultants develop a, a familiarity with with the site, the process and, and the expectations. So they don't have to spend a lot of time reanalyzing data. Okay, any other questions, comments? Nope. Anyone opposed to the passing of this resolution? Nope, then it's carried. Moved by Councillor Horn, second by Councillor Keith, uh, that consent application B12 slash 2021 TPS Halverson be supported. Any discussion? Council McCann. I guess we could uh, ask uh, Mr. Elgy to uh, to speak to this just for the public's benefit. Certainly, through your worship, this is an application to sever an easement on some private property from Addy Street to an existing house on uh, the river, it's known as 7A Cherry Street. Uh, to permit uh, water and sewer servicing to um, provide those services to it. Okay. Any other questions? No. Anyone opposed to the passing of this resolution? No one's opposed. That's carried. Moved by Councillor Borneman, second by Councillor Burden, that the that a decision on Z20 slash 02 Osa Park Drive, John Jackson Planner Incorporated on behalf of Walt Mar Incorporated be deferred as it is premature. Any comments or discussion? Councillor Borneman. Uh, this question, Mr. Mayor, is also for Mr. Algy. In view of the light that we've determined that this is premature at this point, Mr. Algy, is there a timeline that uh, uh, these the proponents can expect uh, or anticipate uh, in uh, reaching an agreement with the town? Uh, through your worship, uh, that's a great question. An option or alternative given is a, a holding provision. So I would imagine if council does choose this as premature, or if they choose that alternative, that would be the next best course forward for the applicant and the applicant's agent to pursue. Uh, the reason I brought it forward now is because they were quite insistent that it come in and be heard and decided upon. Uh, but a, a holding provision, if we narrow down the uses and get all these outstanding matters listed in my report as conditions of it being lifted, that's a pretty normal procedure, truth be told. So there's still a fair bit of work to do. Correct. Okay. Follow up, Councillor Barnum. So, am I hearing, Mr. Algy, that from our perspective, the ball is in their court, basically, that, that they need to, yeah. as you say, narrow down some things here and come back uh, with the application at that point? Uh, through your worship, that, that is my opinion, yes. Councillor McCann. Actually, Councillor Borneman beat me to it with his second questions. That was it. Okay. All right. Any Councillor Keith? Yes, I just want to make the, the one comment. And I want to say, uh, Mr. LG, you did a lot of uh, work there. It certainly it clarified it. There was a lot of detail and there were many pages and you did, I felt you did very well at explaining uh, your position in each area. So I found it really helpful. So thank you. Thank you. 
Anything further? Anyone opposed to the passing of this resolution? Nope, then it's carried. Moved by Councillor Backman and second by Councillor McCann, whereas Community Living Perry Sound has worked to bring people and their community communities together for over 58 years. And whereas Community Living Perry Sound supports people as they develop their capacity to live, learn, work, and participate in all aspects of living in the community. And whereas Community Living Perry Sound helps the community develop its capacity to welcome and support people who have not always had the same opportunities as the rest of us to participate in their community in meaningful, productive ways. And whereas the Council of the Town of Perry Sound wishes to urge its citizens to celebrate the inclusion in our community of people who have a de developmental disability. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Mayor and Council declare the month of May Community Living Month in the Town of Perry Sound. Any discussion, comments? Anyone opposed to the passing of this resolution? That's uh, carried then. Thank you. And Councillor Horn can come back in. Ms. Johnson, you may need to just text them, maybe. Oh, here he comes. Okay, moved by Councillor Keith, second by Councillor Horn. The council authorizes the mayor to sign a letter of support for the Conseil Scolaire Public du Nord-Est de l'Ontario with respect to its capital funding submission to the Ministry of Education to acquire or build a school for Quatrevent in Perry Sound. Any discussion? Councillor McCann. Uh, yes, I, I'm certainly in support of this. I was just wondering, has there been any uh, progress towards a site selection for for such a building? I don't know. Through the uh, through the mayor, they've not shared that with us. They've just asked us if we could support their uh, application for yeah. funding. So just as a sidebar, when you know when we're asked for support in principle, uh, I, I think sometimes more information is better, and uh, if, perhaps maybe they don't have a location. But I, I think when 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 we're asked to uh, support something, sometimes I think more information helps sell the product or service a little bit better. But that's that's my opinion. They just may not have. They may be looking for the money to to do what they need to do. They they, and depending on what money they might get, might depend on whether they just they decide to buy a building or to build a building. So that depends. Sure, I mean that's fair I, enough. Algae can probably answer this question, but I don't see him on here. But um, you know, we haven't heard much from the near north school board either on the mega school that they want to create up. You know where Perry Sound High School is, so that's correct. Um, you know, and supposedly they have their funding. Um, you know, it'd be nice to really get some information from them. Anyway, Mr. Harris, uh, just uh, to add to the to the response to uh, Councillor McCann, this uh, their site selection would be a property matter, and they would be discussing that in close, similar to the town. Uh, they wouldn't want to let. Uh, landowners know what sites they may be looking at if they're at that point, just so the price doesn't all of a sudden go up. Sure, yeah. sure. Again, fair enough, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's a good point. Um, I just have a comment. Okay, Jeremy. yep. Um, just in response to your comment about the high school, is my understanding that it was in the paper that they had picked architects to proceed with the design. And I'm just wondering, would it be in our interest to best interest to maybe invite um, either the school board representative to a council meeting to have uh, an update on where this uh, process is? Yeah, we can try to do that. Um, he seemed rather eager to be sharing information with us, but uh, anyway, that was quite a while ago. 
but we, we can try doing that so staff can reach out to them. Yeah. yeah, I think that would be awesome. Thank you very much. Okay. Anything further on this one with regard to the French school? Anyone opposed to the passing of that resolution? Nope, it's carried then. Attached. Moved by Councillor Keith, seconded by Councillor Horn. At bylaw number 2021-7122, being a bylaw to authorize the execution of a five-year renewal agreement with the Festival of the Sound for the lease of the Charles W. Stockey Center be considered as read a first time. All in favor? That's carried. All members in favor of having the second and third readings. And that's carried. Moved by Councillor Horn, seconded by Councillor Keith, that the bylaw above mentioned be considered as read a second and third time, passed, signed, and sealed. Any discussion? Councillor McCann. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure who would answer this, but uh, I guess I'm just wondering or curious uh, if this particular uh, lease uh, has any provisions or contingency plans for the ongoing COVID pandemic and just uh, and what that would mean, especially if, if the uh, the hall should remain uh, closed or limited in, in its capacity. Uh, I think I can answer that. <laughs> Welcome, Ms. A three-year worship. Um, so much uh, like the rest of the world, we're waiting on public health measures closer to the date um, for this year. And I, it is my understanding that with the Festival of Sound, they're coming up with plan A's, B's, C's based on what restriction levels are, uh, much like the Stocky Center is planning to do with some upcoming events that we're also looking at um, doing over the, the summer and into the fall. Um, there's, there's a lot of moving parts, but, uh, we're hopeful that, uh, the summer might offer some opportunity there, but we're working on different levels and I'm, I'm, it's my understanding that they are too. Yeah. I know it's something the public would have been very interested in. So that's, that's good. Thank you. Any further comments, discussion? Nope. Anyone opposed to the passing of this bylaw? No, nope. that's carried then. Moved by Councillor McCann, seconded by Councillor Bachman, that bylaw number 21, 2021-7119 being a bylaw to adopt the operating capital budget estimate for the year 2021 be considered as first time. All in favor? And that's carried. All members in favor of having the second and third readings? That's carried. Moved by Councillor Backman, second by Councillor McCann, that the bylaw above mentioned be considered as read a second and third time, passed, signed, and sealed. Any discussion? I have a question, Mayor McGarvey. Oh, there you are. Okay, yep. Thank you. Um, my question is for Mr. Karens. Um, in relation to the $80,000 that's been allocated to um, Mission Park, I'd just like to know if you could elaborate on exactly what that entails. I know Previously, we had approved 40,000. We've recently had an increase in. I just wanted to know if you can explain a little bit about that uh, budget cost. Um, certainly, through your worship, uh, I believe that the overall cost includes both the estimate for the playground equipment replacement as well as <clears throat> potentially an accessible play surface. Um, so maybe a bit further to that point, we've had some, uh, just some discussions recently uh, regarding the AODA requirements for accessibility. Uh, 
which we are uh, looking into a little bit further uh, to make sure we understand the actual requirements for accessibility in terms of those uh, facilities within the municipality. So um, we are going to be taking another look at exactly what those requirements are and the possibility of the need to potentially engage our accessibility committee, uh, which I believe Councilor Keith had uh, just spoken about tonight. So um, I will be speaking with our, our HR coordinator uh, who's helping with uh, that committee as well so that we better understand um, those needs before we move on in terms of replacing uh, that playground in particular or any future infrastructure related to uh, to the municipality that is subject to accessibility needs and requirements. Okay, thank you very much. I'm happy to hear that. Anything further? No? Okay. Anyone opposed? Oh, Councilor Borneman? Yes, uh, this, my question's for Mr. Harris, uh, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Harris, we had some conversation some time ago about uh, the obstacles, I guess, for the, the town being uh, impeded in picking and choosing and, and how to. Um, specifically try to help uh, sectors of the tax base with respect to uh, uh, COVID. And I'm, I'm hopeful that you recall that conversation and can uh, lay the, uh, relay that to the public why we've uh, chosen to uh, allow the province and the federal government to uh, provide those types of supports? Uh, certainly, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. I think the first uh, thing, um, we took a lot of time and care to get the tax increase uh, for the town's operations as low as possible before we uh, brought it forward to council for approval. Uh, aside from the infrastructure increase of 1.8%, uh, the increase for the, the entire operations of the town is less than 1% and certainly less than inflation. So the first thing, trying to recognize the, uh, the situations that many residents and businesses find themselves in is to keep our tax increase down uh, as low as possible. And, and we've uh, we had another challenge, a number of challenges this year that tried to push the tax increase up. Uh, having said that, uh, the federal and provincial governments have various programs out there that are designed primarily to help assist businesses and people that aren't working. Uh, they're in a better position to uh, provide the, the type of dollars, the funding that's required for employees that find themselves uh, without work or part-time part, part work and businesses that are struggling. So those programs are in place and offered by the federal and provincial government uh, and the types of dollars that are needed to sustain businesses and, and uh, individuals is much greater than the, the town of Curry Sound could certainly afford. Just uh, recollection is I, I believe it's around $113,000 is a 1% increase in taxes for the town. That's a drop in the, the proverbial bucket in terms of some of the assistance that businesses can get. Um, Having said that, the, uh, our economic development officer has been available and has been working with various businesses, not just businesses located in town, but within uh, the region. Because you recall many, uh, for a number of months, we didn't have a regional economic development officer. So uh, the individual that works for the town was willing to work with anybody that needed assistance in understanding what provincial and federal programs are available, how to apply, how to walk through the, the forms and the process. And uh, I believe he reported in his annual report in February that uh, he had secured, helped secure 10,000, I think another case, $20,000 and fairly significant sums of money for businesses. So the federal and provincial governments have the programs and we've been trying to assist businesses in accessing those programs. Okay, anything further? 
Anyone opposed to this passing of this bylaw? Seeing no opposition, it is carried. Moved by Councillor Burden, seconded by Councillor Borneman, that bylaw number 20, 21, 71, 20, being a bylaw to authorize the execution of a license of occupation with Perry Sound Cruise Line for the use of dock at LT 6 21 PL 154 Perry Sound be considered as read a first time. All in favor? And that's carried. All members in favor of having the second and third readings. That's carried. Moved by Councillor Bornem and seconded by Councillor Burden that the bylaw above mentioned be considered as read a second and third time, passed, signed, and sealed. Any discussion? No. Anyone opposed to the passing of this bylaw? That's carried. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Keith, seconded by Councillor Horn, that bylaw number 2021-7121 being a bylaw to authorize the execution of a lease with Chandler Barging Limited for the use of property identified as lot two, plan 155 being part of um, plan 42R9587, lot three, plan 166, lot four, plan 166, all in the town of Perry Sound be considered as read at first time. All in favor? And that's carried. All members in favor of having the second and third readings. That's carried. Moved by Councillor Horn, seconded by Councillor Keith, that the bylaw above mentioned be considered as read a second and third time, passed, signed, and sealed. Any discussion? No. Anyone opposed to the passing of this bylaw? Seeing no opposition, it is carried. Moved by Councillor McCann, second by Councillor Backman, that bylaw number 20, 21, 71, 23, being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of council, be considered as read a first time. All in favor? And that's carried. All members in favor of having the second and third readings. That's carried. Moved by Councillor Backman, second by Councillor McCann, that the bylaw above mentioned be considered as read a second and third time, passed, signed, and sealed. All in favor? That's carried. So prior to adjourning, I would like to offer the following information to the public regarding the next council meeting. The next regular meeting of council for the town of Perry Sound is scheduled for Tuesday, May the 4th, 2021 at 7 p.m. And may the 4th be with us that night. <laughs> I'm glad some of you got it. Okay, the meeting will be held via Zoom video conferencing and will be live streamed and recorded. All regular council meetings are held at 7 p.m. on the first and third Tuesday of each month, except January and August where only one regular meeting is scheduled. The council meeting schedule, notices of special council meetings, complete agendas and minutes and instructions on accessing live streamed and recorded council meetings are all posted on the town's website go to www.perrysound.ca under news and public notices. Your TV airs council meetings on Saturday at 9.30 a.m. following a regular council meeting. For Kojiko listings, contact www.yourtv.tv. Thank you everyone and have a